Welcome to the G5 Hive and our next installment of our Worker B series, where we deep dive into the G5 college football landscape with the folks that know the teams the best. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, please rate and review. Today, we'll be taking a look at the Florida Atlantic Owls, who finished 4-8 and eight last season. They wrapped up their 2024 spring practice with their spring game on April 13th. We have a special guest joining us today. He is the FAU Athletics Beat Reporter. He is a contributing writer for Bleacher Brothers and FAU Owl Nest. He is the play-by-play announcer for the South Florida Collegiate Baseball League. He is Robbie Lestella. Robbie can be found at FAU underscore owls underscore nest on X. Welcome to the show, Robbie. Guys, thank you for having me on. I love the introduction. I love the uh, the FAU B roll going on with the fight song. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to. I'm ready for football season right about now. Let's t- let's talk a little bit about these owls. But first, we want to ask you a question. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What led you into journalism, play by play announcing, and how long have you been covering FAU? Yeah, well, uh, folks, as they said, my name is Robbie Lestella. I uh, I just actually graduated uh, from FAU in the spring, uh, finished up four years there, um, and I majored in multimedia journalism with a minor in sports studies. Um, I've always kind of been a, uh, a, a play-by-play nerd a little bit. I grew up a uh, big John Sterling, uh, Yankees radio announcer. I'm a big fan of his, and I just always grew up listening to his calls. And some people find him crazy, but I think that makes sports interesting when the announcer's kind of having a good time. And so I, uh, I kind of carried that into uh, college a little bit. Um, spent the first two years um, not in the media side of uh, sports at FAU. I was a fan, uh, but I kind of fell in love with the sports that way. I really I was really passionate about him. Um, and then I got involved with the student radio station. Um, and um, the opportunities there were really good. It got me uh, got me going. And I found uh, found the Bleacher Brothers Network and Owl's Nest and uh, started writing for them uh, my senior year while also doing uh, some play by play. Um, and now I'm uh, still doing the same thing. I picked up, uh, I swapped out the student radio station, uh, for the South Florida Collegiate Baseball League down here. Uh, and I'm still, uh, still covering FAU athletics, uh, in written form for, uh, Bleacher Brothers and Owl's Nest. I'm set to, uh, go up to AAC Media Days, uh, on my birthday, uh, July 21st, uh, the meeting start on the 22nd. Uh, so excited, uh, excited for that. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I'm very passionate about, um, sports in general. I love, I love, I can talk about any sport. If you want to talk about the WNBA, uh, soccer, uh, table tennis, we'll do it. I'm here for it. But uh, I grew up in this area. Uh, admittedly, I grew up a, uh, a big Gators fan um, and kind of kind of fell off a little bit with the Gators as of recently. Uh, but I've been covering uh, Owl Sports now for a couple of years and uh, really diving into that. So how, how would you describe this offense for someone that's uh, never seen the Owls play? Yeah, I would definitely describe it uh, as a pro style offense. Um, it draws both from Tom Herman's experience um, at, at Houston and Texas and both Charlie Fry's pro experience uh, and at Central Michigan. Um, they, there's a play action shotgun centric to it, um, shotgun being its main formation and, and, and the play action uh, set up a lot off of the run game, which draws a lot uh, from Tom Herman's experience. Um, the, the run game is used to, in the beginning of drives to kind of set up play action, open up the field for tight ends a little bit, um, you know, play action, get the tight ends going over the middle, especially in the red zone, um, you know, set up the run game early, early in, early in the drives. Um, and then, you know, you get down to the red zone teams think you're going to hand it off to your back, uh, play action. And then all of a sudden, uh, your tight ends open over the middle. Um, and the same, same thing with that play action, use it, um, to kind of, you need a quarterback in that offense that's that's mobile, um, but it doesn't have to be a Kyler Murray uh, type quarterback. It can be somebody who who who's just got enough mobility to kind of move around in the pocket, and if it collapses, uh, to, to kind of push forward a little bit, uh, gain six seven yards on the ground. Uh, Daniel Richardson was good at that last season. wasn't the most mobile quarterback by any stretch, uh, but was still able to hold his own in the pocket and run with it when they needed to. Um, and in terms of the wide receivers, um, you you see them active both stretching the field um screens pick and pops uh drag routes um any any kind of way to kind of get wide receivers open in space they they'll go for it um but yeah it's a very diverse offense um and one that uh, 
benefits players that play in it uh, because there's there's a variety of different ways they can use guys. Tight ends being uh, very very centric in this offense and and used more in my opinion than most teams uh, in, in college football. They use them both to stretch the field in the red zone, uh, blocking, uh, and they use all of them. So I, I, I it's a very diverse offense and, and and one that that's good at helping players be known as they're trying to get to the next level. Well, let's get into the position where it all starts on offense, and that's the quarterback. Last season, Casey Thompson was their starter, but his season came to an end when he tore his ACL and MCL in their game against Clemson. Daniel Richardson would uh, come on and start the rest of the season for the Owls. Well, both have transferred out of FAU, and Cam Fancher uh, from Marshall transferred in. Then their uh, rushing threat quarterback, Michael Johnson Jr., transferred to Syracuse after the spring. Whose job is it? Is it Fancher's who comes in here from Marshall? Is there anybody else that we need to know about in this room? Well, I, I it, from the looks of it off the spring, uh, spring practices, spring games, some summer workouts, I, I personally believe that there's a little bit of a quarterback battle brewing uh, between Fancher and Tyreek Starks, who are uh, returning from last year. Um, a redshirt junior, both of them, Fancher and Starks. Um, Cam obviously coming from um, Marshall and, and Ty Starks. He uh, spent a year uh, at Independence Community College uh, at from uh, Last Chance U, if you guys remember that show. Um, but Ty is a guy who who spent last season with the Owls, um, was kind of the third string to start the season behind uh, Casey, uh, Daniel Richardson, and then uh, and then it was him. And then after Casey went down, he became the backup, and uh, he saw playing time at times, uh, especially – uh, extended playing action in the final game of the season versus Rice, um, and then and you know and what I've seen from Ty Starks recently is a big jump uh, in his game, um, both in terms of hit. I, what I really liked what I saw in the off season was he put on a, a ton of muscle. I mean, his arm looked like it doubled the size uh, from from last year, uh, and I think that's helped him. He puts a little. He looked like he had a little more zip on the ball. Uh, he looked very confident in the pocket uh, in his in his the reps in the both in practice and. In the spring game itself, um, still, you know, um, accuracy is a little bit of an issue, but he's developing consistently every single day. And, and he's got that, like I mentioned, in the terms of the offense, he's not going to be a guy who runs the read option offense uh, every every play, but he's got the ability to stand in the pocket. But if the pocket's collapsing or nothing's available downfield, he can take it off and run with it. Well, he's got that mobility, probably a, a little bit less mobile than Cam. Uh, but I think where Ty has an advantage on Cam is that he puts zip on the ball. Um, and, and Cam's had accuracy issues in his own right um, at, at Marshall. Um, and so, you know, he, both are very talented quarterbacks, and that is a really good problem to have if you're FAU. Uh, Cam comes in with, obviously, success at the D1 level um, uh, and, and, and experience that, that Tyreek Starks doesn't have. So I think that's, a, that's an advantage in, in Cam's department um, and, and the fact that – it's a weird. It's a little bit weird of a, an advantage, but FAU brought in a really good uh, right tackle, Daughtry Richardson, uh, this season, and he's a native right tackle. So if they were to try to put him over to the left side, that's that's not his biggest strength. I'm sure he could play both positions. But if Cam were to win the starting job, all of a sudden the best offensive lineman FSU transfer becomes his blindside protection and sacks and pocket protection is, was a little bit of an issue last season for the Owls. Uh, so that's an, that's another thing you know that that could possibly favor Cam, uh, but. You know, you asked if the job is decided. I don't think it is. Uh, I think that, you know, Tom Herman's a guy that he, he mentioned in his opening press conference about working with his guys, vouching for his guys, and, and promoting from within is something we've seen, um, at least with his staff. Um, you know, he, he, he rather than kind of rebuild the staff every year, he likes to promote with within and i think that's something to keep in mind with this team as well guys that have come back you know there's there's uh there's been transfers as well um and a lot of that is you know tom herman wanting to get his guys in there and, and work with guys that he recruited um and and if, if if they're still here a year later i i personally think he uh, he's a big believer in them and i think that you know promoting from within is a big part of his culture so it's something to watch for uh with ty starks and and per, and you know it's an it's an uh, it's a possible option for the Owls to if they don't have a surefire winner by week one of the quarterback position, 
it's not it's it's obviously not the most traditional thing, but they could definitely build a package for who's ever the technical second string quarterback. We saw Michael Johnson play pivotal roles last year. Now, I don't think Cam or uh, Ty Starks are the running type of quarterback that Michael Johnson was in that system. But I think there's a, I think there is, a, you know, the ability to create a package for them. And it, it'll be interesting to see what develops over the once camp season begins and, and, and more practices are underway and see if somebody kind of separates themselves a little bit. Because it, it's right now, I mean, there is there's nothing that has said, OK, Cam is QB one for sure. And Ty is QB two for sure. They're kind of taking even reps. They both in the spring game were taking snaps uh, with. Uh, either squad. Uh, FAU didn't do kind of a, an A team or a B team spring scrimmage. They they split the squads up pretty pretty evenly, I would say, and they had the quarterbacks rotate uh, in between uh, each squad. So each uh, both Ty, Cam, Carson Kruver, uh, Kaysen Wiseman wasn't with the team at the time, but those three definitely got. Uh, I wouldn't say Carson got even reps, but Ty and Cam definitely got uh, even reps with with both sides. So. We'll see how everything develops, but I, I think Ty is definitely giving Cam Fancher a run for his money. But Cam's coming in here with a chip on his shoulder as well. Um, you know, things didn't end probably the best way um, they wanted at, at Marshall. So I, I think that it'll be it'll be interesting to see for sure if anyone's able to separate themselves. But I, I, I don't I don't know if anyone will be able to separate themselves and. That's that's not really a, a, the biggest problem in the world. Um, you know, FAU would have loved to have two quarterbacks this past season that were able to take the reins. So we'll we'll see how everything shakes out. But a, a very talented quarterback room as well. And we didn't even you know mention the guys who probably aren't starting uh, with Casey Wiseman coming over from Colorado, Carson Kruver being a talented redshirt freshman, Jaden George coming over from uh, Alabama. It's like fifth school. Uh, but there's 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 different minds in that quarterback room veterans young guys people that have been around different programs and i think that will benefit them uh and, and kind of help them be a really collective unit with some with a really top heavy too in cam fancher and ty stars moving on to the running game the owls lost over 1,000 rushing yards between larry mcgammon and kobe lewis both who have graduated the room does return to barry mobley uh kevon walker and xavier terrell they also bring in C.J. Campbell Jr. from Florida State. Um, you know, the group is some, somewhat young, um, but, you know, how, how did the group lo look in the spring? How, how do you think it's going to shape up here in 2024? Well, the room uh, as a whole looked pretty solid, if I do say so. Uh, C.J. Campbell, uh, you know, made, made his name known in the spring game for sure. Started out uh, the day with a 75-yard tote uh, to the house and that one, and, and for – for Owls fans, that was like kind of like wow, like okay, like we gotta because they blew like they both lose. You lose Larry McCam and you lose Kobe Lewis, uh, and those are your two leading wrestlers. So you're like, oh, who's gonna who's gonna fill that position? Well, you bring in C.J. Campbell from FSU. You've got a returning, but two re really solid returning backs, honestly, in Xavier Terrell uh, and Zoo Mobley, uh, and a redshirt freshman as well in Jamari Sands. I think is a, is another kind of slept on back. Um, uh, he's from the area. Um, and, and he, he's, he's a guy that here in year two might see some carries and he's got, he's got some kind of explosive speed to him. So it, he could be, be a guy that you see gets a carry and kind of takes one to the house. And then all of a sudden he's getting more carries. Um, and, and so with the, with the offensive scheme, Charlie Fry and, and Tom Herman are, are running, it benefits them to have three running backs that can all carry the ball. Um, that's what they kind of tried to implement this last season with Larry being kind of the feature guy, but then also having Terrell and, and zoo and, 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 um, and Kobe Lewis behind him as well and kind of utilizing them. So if they're not wearing boots by a Tuesday of the following week, uh, cause running backs are a very, very tough position. Uh, you, you get hurt, whether, I mean, you can be injury prone, you can't be injury prone, but injuries happen. Um, and, and so to have depth at that position and allow the owls to kind of give guys breaks, um, and, and use them to kind of set up the offense. Like I kind of was trying to say back in the beginning, um, the way they set up the offense is is by kind of getting three, four yards on that first down carry. No huddle, kind of get quick into the quick into it, and then set up set up a short screen to wide receiver, tight end, gain three quick more yards. 
Owls are the best when they can kind of rotate players in and out, move quick on the fly. And that That's when that offense is really successful. And so there's depth in that running back room, which I think will really kind of benefit them going into this season uh, because – Injuries happen, and you still want to be able to kind of run your game plan. And when you're when you're on to your third string running back, and don't don't have anyone behind him because those guys got hurt too. All of a sudden, you can't run every first down because your running back needs break. And and so it, it'll really benefit the Owls to have the depth that they have in this room this season, and they have some veteran leadership in there as well, along with the young guys. How how do you think? Um the room shakes out like between like the three guys. If, if you think it's going to be a three headed monster, so to speak, like, you know, is there going to be like one kind of guy maybe featured more? This guy's going to be the change of pace back. This guy's going to be the goal line back. How do you see that working out? Who's ever healthy? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it, 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 it very well be may, it may be who's ever healthy. Um, but at the moment, probably leaning towards CJ Campbell just because he's got that they bring him in here from FSU they pair him up with Daughtry Richardson on the offensive line he can kind of know a little bit of familiarity there um and and he looked really really good in that spring game obviously as i mentioned had that 75 yard tote um but he he's a guy that has <clears throat> he's looking to kind of prove himself never got that chance at FSU and I personally don't believe he would have came to FAU if he didn't have a chance at playing time. Um, so I, I think he's really got a kind of a, a little bit of a leg up to try to get that starting job just because of the experience. And and then uh, I don't want to give him I don't want to give the P5 transfer to because talent can come from anywhere. Um, but the fact you do bring in two FSU guys. Uh, there's familiarity with their with that they've played at the at, at a championship level, been been a part of a championship level, and so I think that kind of comes in here and and he's that leader in that running back room. But it doesn't take anything away from Zoo Mobley, Xavier Terrell, uh, who can who can come in and, and still probably carry the ball six to eight to ten times per game behind him, maybe. Maybe, maybe might be a little bit a lot, but and still provide relief and, and still put up numbers as well. So probably CJ Campbell for sure, but I think the the depth will be utilized for sure to kind of help this offense uh, stay healthy throughout the season. When um, so that first carry against Michigan State is that CJ Campbell or you think someone else? Uh, I think, yeah, I think, it, I think it'll be CJ Campbell, but I also wouldn't be surprised to see them in a, in a two running back set uh, with, with zoo and, and CJ both out there. And who knows, maybe they do a play action, fake it to zoo, roll out to the right and then do a little pop screen to CJ. I don't know. Uh, they, but it, I, I personally, if it's, if it's a carry with one running back, yeah, it'll probably be uh, it'll probably be CJ. But the, that's the thing about this offense; they they'll they'll surprise you. They'll come out there with two running backs, and they'll give it to Zoo instead of CJ when you think it'll be CJ. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say CJ. But um, I, I they could have even carries by the end of the game for sure. Well, the passing game will look a lot different in 2024. Uh, Jaquan Burton is out of eligibility. Tony Johnson transferred to Cincinnati. Uh, Devin Price is off to Old Miss. However, there is no bigger loss to this room than LeJonte Westard, who was an AAC all-conference first team, and he's off to Colorado. How did FAU go about replacing these losses? Well, they did it uh, kind of in abundance. Um, in last season, uh, in, in the wide receiver room, you kind of saw, you kind of saw all of the targets going to Lejante Wester, and that's that's not a bad thing. I mean, the guy was one of the best uh, wide receivers in the country, if not the best. Um, so you know, you lose him, and you lose all of those targets that he was able to haul in for the most part. I mean, he, he was catching; it wasn't they weren't just targeting him; he was catching most of those passes, and so that 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 eliminates a huge him leaving takes away probably 90 percent of the offense and so they they decided rather than bringing in another guy who can replicate those 90 receptions or what i'm for, i'm blanking on the exact statistics but uh, the big numbers he had and they bring in a lot of different guys they bring in milan tucker they bring in caleb coombs they bring in joe young from the the juco level um they bring in dom henry if i didn't say his name already um they bring in point being they bring in at marlon johnson from buffalo they bring in four five six names here to kind of try to 
fill the room. And, and instead of what I really envisioning happening with this uh, wide receiver room next season is rather than having a guy who catches 70, 80 percent of the targets, it's going to be a spread the sharing the wealth a little bit at that wide receiver room. I mean, you know, they bring in a guy like Marlon Johnson who can pair with BJ Alexander on the outside and, and, and be downfield threats. I mean, Marlon's six, four, I believe. And he's got a huge frame. Owls haven't really had that type of jump ball receiver. Jamal Edger, since Jamal Edrian left, uh, he let transferred to Purdue after uh, Willie Taggart left. But I, I, you know, with having outside receiving threats now, they bring in uh, Caleb Coombs, as I mentioned. They bring in Milan Tucker. They bring in Dom Henry. A lot of those guys, they can go in the slot. They can play both inside and outside. Uh, Omari Hayes being a guy as well that that made his name known in the spring game. Uh, and, and Joe Young is another guy who had a – he caught a big pass downfield in the spring game. I think Joe is a guy that um, a lot of people are kind of – sleeping on a little bit uh just because there's so many wide receivers in that room that it's like you don't know who is really going to be the number one guy yet um and, and there's just a lot of talent overall in that room and so rather than bringing in like i said one guy to kind of fill 80 percent, they bring in five six guys that can all do different things and and now you, i feel like you'll see an offense where you kind of have maybe four or five receivers catching 20, 30 plus balls on the year. Um, and, and we'll see how it all shakes out. Obviously on paper, all of these guys have contributed at their past stops, um, whether or not all of them are still contributing. We'll see. Um, we'll see how it all shakes out. Um, but that's another thing. I mean, injuries at the wide receiver position last year, if it had Lejante Wester gotten hurt, it would have been it would have been pretty grim, and so having having this depth, both at same thing with the running back position, same thing with the wide receiver position. Sure, maybe you're not going to go out there and have these all five of your transfer wide receivers make an impact week one, but having those wide receivers and having them buy in and and, and be a part of the culture and 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 understanding. Okay, yeah, I'm not coming here to be Lejante Wester. I'm coming here to be myself, and if that role is I need to step in when so-and-so gets hurt. I need to step in on third downs. I need to step in when they want to go deep. I need to step in when they do a screen. I think that benefits them a lot. And I think it was a, a very smart way to approach filling the, the wide receiver room this off season, rather than trying to go get one guy who can, who can stuff the stat sheet like Wester did, because let's face it. I mean, there's not many guys out there who are able to stuff the stat sheet like Wester did and be as talented and make those, make those plays every single play. Uh, that's a tough, tough, tough ass to fill, especially in the transfer portal. And so I think bringing in guys who are all talented and, and can do different things and play individual roles will not only help them sell out, but it'll help the offense kind of gel as a whole a little bit because everyone will feel more involved. Well, BJ Alexander must be like a, a grad, an, an exemption or something. He's back. You got Jay Sean Platt. He returns. BJ was the leading uh, returner at Whiteout that's going to be coming back to this room. He had 10 receptions for 104 yards and one touchdown. So that kind of gives you know our listeners an idea of, of what's coming back and, and how much uh, – Lejante Wester kind of meant to this team, but between those two and the transfers, how did this group look into this in the spring, and what should we make of Omari Hayes's uh, spring game? Because it looked like he got a fair amount of work. Yeah, yeah. Um, with BJ, you know, he's a guy that like he got buried in the depth chart uh, behind Bert behind Lejante last season, um, and and he's a, he's a really talented wide receiver. Uh, as you mentioned, he had the ten catches for 104 uh, last season, but he's also he's another guy that's he's six three, uh, and so you know having him on the outside, utilizing him in, in jump ball scenarios is going to be something I believe the Owls will do this season. I think. He's got a potential to start on the outside for the Owls, for sure. Um, you know, it's possible that him and Jay Sean both start on the outside and you see Omari Hayes in the slot. That's a possible combination right there. Is that for sure what the combination is going to be? No, but uh, that, it's very possible that those guys all make impacts because 
as you mentioned Omari, he was really he was what I liked about Omari Hayes is that he had a connection both with Fancher and Ty Starks in that spring game. Um, and he was able to, to to impact the game in kind of a variety of ways. He stretched the field a little bit, caught passes over the middle, and where he really made his bread and butter in that game, at least, was the uh, the screens. He was he was able to be really shifty, catch behind the line of scrimmage, cut up, uh, and, and gain first downs on screen passes, which that's a big part of the Sal's offense as well. Picking pops off the play action, kind of confuse the defense a little bit. Um, and I, I, I'm personally really high in Omari. I think he's got the potential. Uh, being, it's tough to say like who's going to be the number one wide receiver in this room. Um, it, it'll kind of come down to who is who number one who becomes the starting quarterback because each guy is going to have the guys that they're close with and and have those connections with. But if if it is, you know, if one of those guys happens to have that connection with Omari where it's third down, it's third and three, they have me in a passing situation and, you know, Omari's running a slot or it's uh, Wyatt Sullivan running a curl up the middle, going to throw it to Omari because he trusts him more. And that that that's just that's just a little bit of an example. But I. I'm very high on Omari, and I think that he he kind of burst on the scene and here in uh, in the spring and is is really going to be able to possibly make an impact this season for the Owls. You're looking for guys to kind of stand out. Uh, like I said, there's a ton of talent in this room, and a lot of these guys can do different things. Um, and it'll kind of come down to who stands out, who's making making their making a name for themselves uh, in these spring camps and, and spring camps over, but summer and and leading into uh, into fall. So. I don't necessarily have somebody who's going to be the the number one for you uh, at the moment, uh, just because there's so much talent in this room. I think there's potential for three, four, or five guys to be the number one wide receiver this season. It just it just depends how how things shake out. The offense is still developing, um, but uh, having too much talent is never a bad thing. Um, so earlier you kind of explained to us how tight ends are utilized in this offense and the group of tight ends they return, um, they're pretty deep and definitely have some game experience. Uh, they bring back Zeke Moore, Khalil Brantley and Wyatt Sullivan. How did that room look this spring and did anyone like any single guy stand out for you or? Room looks solid. Uh, I'm going to know. I mean, the tight end position in that game, you know, they were doing what they do, uh, catching third down passes over the middle, uh, solid run blocking, red zone threat. Uh, I believe Wyatt Sullivan caught a touchdown in that one. Um, and, and that's kind of the thing with this Owls tight end room uh, between Sullivan, between Brantley, um, and, um, I miss Elijah Brown, who high school teammates with Cam Fancher. So you talk about connections right there. That's one of them, uh, you know, having a high school team and Elijah Brown's an Alabama transfer. So the talent talent. It's probably there. Uh, didn't get didn't get to play a whole ton uh, last season, but now having you know having his high school quarterback on the squad could could put something in his favor. But that's the thing with this Owls unit is there's so many uh, the tight end unit between Sullivan, between Brantley, between um, all of these guys. They all can kind of contribute and. I think that's it again. That's it's like the same thing with the running back room is the same thing with the wide receiver and tight end room. There's depth there. Uh, and I, and I really do think that that depth benefits them and they're able to kind of, okay, they can put out Wyatt Sullivan here over the middle to try to kind of be a big threat over the middle. They can bring in Khalil Brantley to kind of be a, uh, um, you know, another red zone threat. Zeke Moore uh, really came and made a name for himself as a freshman uh, this past season. Uh, and, and to see Tom Herman in year one of his era kind of trust a, a freshman tight end to, to be a target in third downs, uh, end zone or red zone type plays. He trusted Zeke more a lot uh, and, and called his number a lot, and he came through. Um, so in, in that room, if there's somebody that's kind of number one right now, it's Zeke Moore. Um, but I mentioned all the other guys before him kind of for a reason just to show you that – there's a lot of talent there and they're all, they're all kind of dialed in with each other. Um, you know, you ask if I, uh, you ask them kind of, is there, is there, is it ever hard to try to, you know, train with these guys knowing there's only one starting role and at, at any of these positions, the answer is always no, no, no. Like the whole team is really bought in uh, to kind of working with each other and, and kind of, 
putting the best foot forward. If that if that means Khalil is starting, if that means Zeke is starting, doesn't really matter to them as long as they're they're winning games and 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 getting better each week. So uh, that that sounds like a lot of coach speak, but I I that that's really the mentality that they're they're rocking with, and so. Same thing as the wide receiver running back position, uh, tight end, a little bit more of an advantage towards Zeke Moore, but still a ton of a ton of depth in that room and, and a ton of uh, a ton of potential for talent uh, to play this season, uh, both together in one tight end sets. There's a lot they can do with their tight ends. Well, the offensive line will need to gel together quickly. They lost their left guard, Dorian Hinton, to Texas A&M, Kamar Bell to South Carolina. And uh, they're starting left tackle. you got uh, uh, Marquise Robinson and right tackle Chaz Neal are both out of eligibility. That means their sole starter coming back for this line is their center. Uh, We're going to give this name a whirl. Frederico Maranjas, Is is that close enough? I believe so. Yes, I believe so. All right. All right. And, and the, you know, what did the staff do to fill those losses? Well, for starters, they bring in um, a big, a big uh, offensive tackle pickup. Uh, we talked about him, Daughtry Richardson, probably starting right tackle. Uh, and the staff is already really high on him. Uh, he He's just, he he's a guy that, you know, he's, He's a potential NFL prospect with one or two good seasons here at FAU. With really one good season at FAU with how the world's going, Daughtry could be back at the P5 level uh, next year. But hopefully that doesn't happen for Owls fans out there. But Daughtry's a really talented uh, staple for this for this offensive line piece. Pairing him with Frederico kind of gives them two anchors, like right in the middle and right on the edge. Uh, and, and then, you know, the rest of the offensive line, there's still some some work to figure out who exactly uh, is going to take over all of the other roles. Uh, Jordan Church is a guy who uh, in his second year uh, at the guard position, he he's he's a guy that's put on a ton of muscle in this offseason too, uh, making a name for himself a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm Lamar, same thing. He's, uh, another, another guy. Um, he's, he's in his grad year. Uh, but he, he, he'll, he'll, excuse me, he'll be able to, uh, make an impact on the offensive line, uh, as well. So, and then another, another name that, you know, I'm high on, he's, uh, I'm personally high on him. He may not crack the depth chart right away. Keon Rowey, uh, a German born offensive tackle. He is a mammoth of a human being. Um, I believe he's six foot seven. I had it right, wrote down over here. Yeah. Six foot seven, 300 pounds freshman, uh, from Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Um, he's, uh, he's a guy of a d- developmental piece for sure. Uh, but you know, if things work out, you know, he trains behind Daughtry a little bit, I don't see. I mean, having him start opposite uh, Daughtry on that line, I think that is. I think that's a very like dynamic combo, uh, especially a uh, Keon. You know, he didn't even grow up playing football, and he kind of came into it recently. Uh, and he's and he's talented. He's got solid footwork for somebody who did not grow up uh, playing football. So both of those guys, they bring in, they bring in different pieces, uh, for sure. It's not, you know, they don't, they didn't bring in, they didn't bring in a left tackle, a left guard, a right guard and a right tackle. Um, but there's, there's, there's got different guys. They play different positions. Um, it, uh, you, you mentioned a guy, Jacavian Nonar. He's another guy who can possibly step in and play, uh, for the owls this season. So, a lot of l- offensive line is still definitely a little bit of a question mark, but two solid anchor pieces there uh, in Daughtry Richardson and Frederico as well. Uh, having those two will will definitely help this offensive line kind of gel together once they figure out okay who's going to be the rest of these uh, rest, fill, fill in the rest of the line really. All right, uh, we've we've talked a lot about the depth that they have and, and a lot of possibilities. But this time, I need you to pick pick a guy to have a breakout type season uh, for the offense here in twenty twenty four. A breakout guy, give give me. It's, I'm going to go wide receiver for sure, and it's a toss up at the moment. Um, okay. Omar Omari Hayes is def, it's between uh, for me. It's between Joe Young and Omari Hayes. Uh, both of them have the potential to really kind of pop off for the Owls. Uh, Joe being a guy who's who's worked his way up from the juco level uh he's got a great mentality to it uh and a ton of talent as well good speed 
stretch the field. Both him and Omari can stretch the field and and have really good route running. Can can catch in traffic. Can kind of make moves in space. I mean, they they all they check all the boxes. Both of them uh, in terms of what you want out of a potential slot receiver guy. Uh, Joe honestly could probably play both inside and outside for the Owls. So I like. Omari or Joe Young to potentially kind of pop off uh, for the Owls this season. We shall see. The wide receiver room is still still a big question, um, but if if they get put in a position to succeed, I think they're in line for a big season for sure. Whoever well, gets move the over start. To... Right. Well, let's move over to the defensive side of the ball and talk about the guys up front along that defensive line. They lost their leader in sacks in Dem uh Dakarius Hawthorne to USF. Latrell Jean goes to Temple. And then Evan Anderson, he ran out of eligibility. Despite those losses, they have a good core uh, of guys coming back. You got Chris Jones, uh, Marlon Bradley, Jaden Wheeler, and Jacob Merrifield. How did that unit look in the spring? And who do you feel needs to like step up the most in this room? Yeah, they definitely, uh, Owls definitely did lose um, some production there, especially between Hawthorne and Gene. But they were able to go out there and, and bring in new talent. I mean, Wilkie Denod uh, coming over from Auburn and Mississippi State. Uh, he only played the spring at Mississippi State. But Eric Brantley coming over from uh, from Colorado. Uh, you mentioned Jaden Wheeler back. Um, Prince Boyd and uh, Bryce Langston, they, they'll be forces in the middle. Um, so there is just a ton of talent coming in. To the point where, you know, some of these guys may have to sit a little bit uh, just because they're, they're not going to be able to play every down. Uh, but that's another thing with this unit. I mean, we'll see packages where we'll have uh, Jacob Merrifield coming out there to stop the run. We'll see pass uh, packages where Wilkie Donat is in there for pass, pr uh, pass pressure. Um, in terms of stepping up, the loss of Evan Anderson is – critical for the owls he was one he was a huge not only was a pass rushing threat but he was a huge run stopping threat for the owls uh and so jacob merrifield is a guy that i want to see be able to put a whole season together hopefully not dealing with any injuries and and be that force uh stop teams from get, getting four or five yards on first down bring merrifield out for first and second down have them snuff the run bring out eric brantley wilkie denod off the edge possibly uh and and then and then you have a pass pro unit uh as well so uh, a ton of talent in that room as well as a lot of the owls have been very good at least this at least on paper uh bringing in a depth which was an issue for them last season so with with this d line unit i like the ability to run multiple sets have a have a run stopping unit have a have a attack the quarterback unit have a have a unit that's just out there to kind of um in, in passing situations to kind of provide pressure but can also drop back so i i, I personally I, I like all the additions that they've made to kind of make up for those losses now i'm interested to see though there's a ton you're bringing in guys from everywhere you're bringing them in from lsu auburn colorado um and so these guys, I imagine they want to play, um, and there's only so many spots uh, on that defensive line to go around. So, um, you know, it, how it is with the tight end room, everyone's bought in. It doesn't matter who's playing. Um, want to see the defensive line get to a point where that's the same thing. May already be at that point, but, you know, these guys are all new, so they're going to have to gel a little bit, at least for the majority. I mean, you know, Jacob's back, uh, Jaden Wheeler's back, Marlon Bradley's back, but um, – with all the new talent coming in, I want to see them gel and be okay saying, okay, yeah, this is Jacob's set. He's going to go snuff the run. And then Wilkie's coming on to go attack the quarterback. So just just, just a little bit of um, uh, an analysis there to try to try to see what how these guys kind of all play together without getting too big, if that makes sense. Because these guys are all really talented, and they're going to have to try to fit into individual roles that may not be every down. Moving over to the linebackers, they lose a pair of guys who played a lot of meaningful snaps for the Owls last season. They were mostly uh, outside linebackers, or in today's game, we call them edges, um, and Courtney McBride and Morvin Joseph. McBride is off to South Alabama. Joseph is off to Jacksonville State. Um, but they do bring back their leading tackler. It had 82 tackles a year ago. Um, Jackson Ambush and their 30, third 
leading tackler Desmond Tisdall. They also bring back Jared Jarrells. Um, how do the linebacker groups look in the spring, and did anyone stand out for you? Linebacker unit uh, is safe and sound. That's probably the the in my opinion, the most least question marks, you know, this unit's ready to go. Uh, the quarterbacks of the defense, Jackson Ambush, Jarrett Gerald's, um, Des Tisdall, um, and, and Eddie Williams, all four of them are all could play like, in my opinion, are all really leaders of this this whole team not just the defense uh, obviously they're the quarterbacks of the defense but just a ton of leadership there and and a ton of talent as well i mean we saw all that jared Charles was a tackle machine alongside uh jackson ambush des has that familiarity uh with rock scheme coming over from auburn and eddie williams has been here since um the the end of the uh lane kiffin era so he he's seen fau in their glory days winning bowl games uh having packed out stadiums the whole nine so having eddie back this season in his final year um fully healthy which has been uh, an issue for him over the past couple years that's an underrated uh guy in this linebacker unit just because he hasn't he hasn't been 100 percent now probably two years or so. So he's hit him, him being at a hundred percent alongside Gerald's alongside Jackson. And um, I really think this linebacker unit is really solid. Uh, you asked who, who stood out. Definitely Eddie. Uh, especially, it's just his mindset to me. Um, you know, he, he's kind of the OG of this defense. He's been around uh, forever. And and so having him here as kind of an anchor uh, for, for all the new additions, both in the safety unit and, and on the defensive line is important. It's it's important to, to have that guy who's been around, who knows. All right. Yeah. You know what? None of these guys here have seen FAU be at their best I have and I know it's capable to win in paradise for sure and so I think I think Eddie is is a guy that that if has a big year he could potentially uh get some pro looks um later round type thing so we'll see uh we'll see it we'll see how things shake out obviously um but ton of talent in that linebacker room as well uh it, I, I sound like a broken record I'm sorry but they they they've done a good job at, at as I've said bringing in depth and keeping depth, especially, if, you know, you lose um, Wester at the linebacker position. But other than that, it's it's really all right. And they've been able to maintain the core of Gerald's and ambush. So, Well, let's go maybe to the opposite end of the spectrum there on the defensive side. The defensive backfield lost 11 guys to the portal or no longer have any eligibility. What should we expect from the defensive backfield here in 2024? Defensive backs, yes. So that uh, it's the same thing in the sense that they have depth, a ton of depth, but a lot of younger depth. Uh, CJ Hurd, Mike Wright, uh, two really young prospects that could honestly potentially start uh, this season. Probably not, though, just because there's so much depth still in that room. Um, you know, they bring in uh, Phil Dunham from Indiana, who I think has a potential to be all AAC. Uh, he's a he's a ball hawk out there. Um, at the safety position, pair him up with Jaden Williams back there. That's a really strong safety unit. Um, another guy uh, in that in that DB room, safety cornerback area, Chris Tooley. Uh, he he could play he could play safety, he could play slot. He could he could probably go right or left corner too. But bread and butter for Chris would probably be um, in the slot. And I and I think. Um, he's a guy that the players from last year, Jerron Morris specifically talked about Chris Tooley's season is, or is next up, uh, next season. Um, and so we'll see, obviously, you know, maybe that's the players talking about their guy didn't, didn't do anything too spectacular in the spring game. Didn't do anything bad either. Just, you know, DB position. You, you either have an interception, have 10 tackles or you don't. Um, but he was, he was solid in, in his limited snaps, didn't get blown by or anything out there. Uh, so I'm interested to see kind of more reps from him and see if, you know, if he's making that jump that his teammates, uh, believed he could make into this season. Uh, but there's, there's depth in that room. Uh, Fabian Scott, another guy who was here last year, uh, could, could potentially play in that safety position. Um, but there's just so many guys, uh, CJ Hurd, uh, was probably the top defensive player freshman that they were able to bring in in this class and I don't see a path for playing time for him this season unless there there is an injury um because you uh, probably the, the if he were to play it would have to be 
either in the nickel out, out of position because he's a safety or somebody would have to be injured to for CJ to play uh, because there's there's just so much. There's uh, Day Day Hill at, at corner, uh, Bugs Brown, a guy who they brought in from Maine. He he's he's probably a shoe in at, at corner as well. Uh, and then they bring in Wendell Filord, local guy from uh, from Kaiser University uh, down here, uh, and he he's a safety, but probably the starting slot. Uh, he's just, he's, he, he was just, I believe he was the starting slot, uh, for one, I want to say the red team in the spring game. Uh, and, and he looked good. So I, I personally think that in that, in that DB room, it's the same thing as all, uh, as, as the, the wide receiver room, there's a ton of talent there. Uh, they brought in a ton of pieces this off season, uh, both transfer portal and I, and there's, they're, the freshmen that they've been able to bring in, uh, Mike Wright and CJ Hurd at, at that at that safety position, and Kyle Boylston as well, really talented. And and they're not there's not necessarily uh, a path uh, to playing time right away for them. So that that's I'm a huge fan of the depth that they have because uh, again, DB is a, a position both CB and safety that they deal with they deal with injuries. Um, Antonio Smith was probably. Uh, the guy who stood out the most uh, during the, the, the spring game, he, I believe he had a pair of interceptions. Um, and, and, you know, he's a guy that's been around for a couple of years now. Um, and uh, or I believe this is his third year with the squad. And so he's, he, he, he's got an, a, a, a reason to be playing this year. And, and again, there's just so much talent that I don't necessarily know if standing out in the spring game like that is going to, get him a spot. He looked incredible uh, for the Owls in that, in that spring game, but you don't want to put too much stock into just that spring game. So, but there's just so much talent uh, that, they're going to be able to plug and play guys. All right. Yeah. We think it's run. Uh, we're going to sub in so-and-so because he's going to be our run guy. Uh, it, it's, it's still yet to be seen. It's kind of like the defensive line. They got to figure out individual packages, but Again, there that's that's going to be another benefit for this team because they're not going to have to keep guys out there for 10 straight plays, 12 straight plays. They'll be able to sub uh, and they'll be able to bring in fresh legs that aren't just backups like these guys could, especially the freshmen. Once uh, once Kyle, once Mike, once uh, CJ heard see the field. It, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be hard pressed to imagine that they'll be able to limit their snaps. I mean, these guys are talented, uh, and that and CJ heard was probably. And there's NIL rumors out there, but he was at FAU was able to get him over uh, conference rival ECU. And there's rumors out there that ECU was putting up big NIL money for him, and, and FAU was able to uh, to it was able to pull him in. So uh, if they're offering, if they're trying to bring these guys in from conference opponents, they, they I, I'm hard pressed to believe they would do it uh, just to have them sit on the bench. So a ton of talent in that DB room, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who who wins the wins the battles and uh, kind of makes a name for themselves over the summer. Because it's still a toss up, honestly. Uh, the you know the guys I mentioned, uh, Day Day Hill, Phil Dunham, Bugs Brown, those guys possibly maybe shoe ins with Phil being like ninety nine percent starting safety for me. Um, but other than that, it's, it, it, it's really tough. There's, there's a ton of talent and we'll, and we'll see who, uh, who, who is the guy that coach rock calls on is like, yeah, you're my starting, right. My starting left. We'll see. All right. So if you have to pick a defensive player to have a breakout type season here in 2024, who are you going to bet on? Ooh, uh, hmm, it's tough. So I want to say, I want to give it to one of the DBs. Um, but you know, I don't necessarily know off the top of my head. It's like wide receiver. And so I've said wide receiver, I'd pick two wide receivers. I'm going to pick somebody who I know for a fact will play this season. Uh, Wilkie Denod, uh, transfer from Mississippi state, Auburn, uh, familiar with coach rock, coach rock recruited him out of high school, uh, to go to Auburn, spent last year's red shirt at Auburn, uh, transferred to Mississippi state for the spring. Didn't work out. And then now he's here in FAU. He is a massive human being. I just just based off of our sh my short time seeing him, he just looked he looks the part of somebody who's going to dominate the trenches uh, for FAU, and and he's and he dominated um, uh, the five six one high school level too for John Carroll High School. Uh, so he's familiar with the type of talent that 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 plays down here. Uh, although it's the high school level, there's a lot of guys that that on FAU that 
played in the Tri County area, and he's and he's making a name for himself amongst his teammates, I believe. So you know, kind of kind of playing off that a little bit. I think he's in for a big season coming back into his hometown where he was a big high school athlete down here. Now, uh, you know, probably one, uh, in my opinion, probably one of the top three D, uh, D linemen on this squad. I think he's in for a big year. Uh, if he can, if he can, you know, be one of those guys where he's not just a rotational package player. Uh, as if he if he's if he's on the field for a majority of the snaps, I think Wilkie's in for a potential to be an all a AAC type of player along with Phil Dunham. If it's not if it's not Wilkie, it's Phil Dunham for me. Phil Dunham is another guy that I think has the potential to be a, a ball hawk and safety for the Owls. Well, with spring practice now over, which position group or groups do you feel is the most concerning? I don't know if FAU's got any more scholarships to to offer. Is there maybe anything that they're they're looking to go after here in the portal? I think I think they're pretty much about done in terms of portal additions. But I'm I'm the probably I wouldn't say concerned just yet, but I would say there's a big question mark on that wide receiver room. Who is going to be the guy to kind of? It because it's going to be different. Uh, it's not going to be the Lejante Wester special catching, uh, you know, the hundred balls. It's going to be. It's going to have to be spread around, um, you know, and it's going to be who's going to who's going to step up and be that number one, but also be okay with not being targeted every single time because I feel like you know I feel like that became a bit of an issue for the Owls once you know Lejante obviously was carrying them, but you know teams started to shoe in on that. Uh, and, 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 and towards the end of the season, it just didn't seem like Lejante was dominating like he did earlier in the year against UAB and those crazy games that he had. So I think it's the wide receiver room just because there's so much newness in it. Um, and then that's kind of an unfamiliar range. I'll be interested to see how and who steps up and, and is the number one. I mean, my, my sleeper guys are in there, and Omari Hayes, not a sleeper anymore after his big uh, spring game, and Joe Young. But uh, there's no guarantees that they're going to play either. So uh, it'll be interesting who steps up and who makes uh, the, you know, the name for themselves this offseason. Yeah, it sounds like uh, FAU has a lot of depth heading here into 2024. Would you say that's the main strength of the team or, or something else? I think so, absolutely. Uh, if I didn't say it enough uh, <laughs> throughout the show, the depth uh, that this team has is – and I, and that that that's playing off of last year where they didn't have any depth. Uh, that was the big issue. I mean, um, you know, they were playing with a skeleton crew by the time they got to Rice, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So – Having now having all of these guys that are capable of playing at least on paper, it's is huge. Uh, obviously, some things may not work out for some guys, and all uh, and the, the depth will probably shrink out a little bit. But at the moment, right now, the depth is incredible uh, across the board. Really, uh, offensive line still a little bit of a question as well, um, alongside the wide receiver unit. But you know, they there's talent there, and it, it's just got to work itself out. In terms of injuries to the offensive line, I think in terms of depth, I think that would probably be the position I'm a little bit more concerned about. They didn't bring in a ton of offensive line transfers, um, but definitely um, still talent there. If there's if if there's one position that doesn't have a ton of depth, though, it is offensive line. But overall, I still think that's the Owls' biggest strength. Well, when it comes to recruitment of new players and the retention of existing players, how has the NIL and transfer portal impacted FAU? Yeah, I think FAU is definitely proactive uh, in the at world of NIL, uh, whether it's fundraising, whether it's brand awareness, uh, doing things uh, to try to, uh, you know, promote the promote the program promote the nil uh, various assets that they have i think that it's been really strong and and for football it's kind of tough uh because basketball at the school kind of started exploding right at the same time nil started getting really big and so not only did fau have to start an nil collective a couple of years ago but they had to balance it and be like okay yeah basketball just went to a final four but 
we're still we still have this beautiful stadium. We still want to be uh, Brian White, athletic director for FAU, talks about being an everything school. Uh, it's not just being a basketball school. It's not just being a football school. It's not just being a basketball and a football school. They wants to be good at baseball. Wants to be good at softball. Wants to be good at football and basketball. Um, and so. I think they've done a really good job of finding ways to spread the wealth, um, doing different things for having guys who are raising NIL specifically for basketball, having a, a football centric NIL fund. I think it's I think it's important, and I think that I think that FAU is a little bit um, ahead of uh, some schools in the sense that they've 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 been on this since as, as soon as they've been allowed uh, the the Owl Collective. Um, it's really growing and you know we're talking about football but I, I see its benefits really in basketball at the moment uh you know it's really good in football too don't get me wrong they were able to we talked we mentioned cj heard the nil with ecu they were able to get him they were able to bring in daughtry richardson from fsu who's probably getting some and a significant nil uh offers contributions whatever you want to call it as well but basketball they were able to revamp an entire roster uh in this in one off season they lose an entire basket they literally probably all but three or four guys and none of those guys were the main scorers uh hit the portal and they were able to bring in at, i believe it's four guys who averaged double figures at the d1 level last season um along with some uh some international guys as well so they had to, the, the the NIL is definitely spreading to basketball and football, but to really see how much FAU has been able to collect and kind of emphasis, it, I I I focus I dial in on basketball a little bit just because rebuilding a team is not easy, uh, and on paper it looks like FAU is 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 on the path to be back in the AAC uh, conference championship next season in basketball. Uh, football, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough a little bit to kind of see how well it's doing but it, it it looks on from the outside and it looks like it's doing really well they're they, they're not struggling to bring in talent at all so that was the second time it not necessarily football but you mentioned international players this time for basketball what's fau got as a pipeline over in yeah internationally what can you, what's going on there do you know anything around that well, in football, I, I, Keon, uh, that's kind of a bit of a, a one-off. I mean, they don't, it's their, their, the whole squad isn't international in football. Uh, Keon's just a great story. I love that story, especially because he didn't grow up playing football. And now here he is, this mammoth of an offensive lineman that, that, that I said, you know, he's got the footwork of a guy who's, who probably should have been playing football growing up. Uh, but in basketball, it's uh, John Jacobs, who's their coach, uh, is really big international. Uh, he coached overseas, uh, and he's got a lot of connections um, from coaching overseas that he's now using uh, in the world of NIL. And so you talk about um, NIL, international guys, they're not uh, – This it's harder for them to receive NIL. They have to – they have to do it. They can only receive NIL when they're overseas. Uh, they can't receive the, with the visas and stuff like that. They can't receive money uh, for services if they're on a student visa, if they're in the United States. But if they're back in their home country, they can. So they can still pay international players NIL money, but it's much harder. So FAU bringing in international guys helps out a little bit, uh, at least in basketball, because they can probably give a little more NIL to people who are coming over stateside if they're bringing in talent overseas uh, as well. And they've definitely done that. I mean, the, both of the big men they, they got to replace Vlad Golden, who's off to Michigan, um, Montas, Kosa, Montas Koshanas and Matas Vokitatis. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounced those because I'm still learning as well. Uh, but both of those guys, um, they're, they're coming over to the Owls uh, and, and from overseas, and I think that they'll play at the big men position next season, uh, center and power forward. So, And they brought them in, and, and now we're able to bring in four guards who average double figures uh, at the D1 level alongside them. Well, I'm going to say you nailed the pronunciation. I probably would not do nearly <laughs> as good as that. So great job there, Robbie. Um, trying. All right. Uh, it seems more and more that the demands of a head coach are really turning into, you know, more of a general manager type role. You have recruiting, you have, uh, you know, not just recruiting freshmen, right? But you're, you're recruiting out of the transfer portal. You're trying to retain your own roster and then you add fundraising on top of all that. Um, and so maybe they're not as involved in the X's and O's 
as they have been in the past. Do you see that happening there at FAU or, you know, do, do they do a good job of like delegating and, um, you know, just kind of all taking different roles and helping out? I, I personally think Tom Herman is probably a very hands-on head coach, but not overbearing. I don't think he's uh, barking down Charlie Fry's neck like, you need to run this play, this is my team. Nah, nah, nah. What I was trying to mention is that Tom Herman and uh, and Charlie Fry, um, they draw off of each other and, and, and try to get the offenses. Each of them kind of have different – Charlie Fry draws from the pros a little bit when he was with the Dolphins, uh, and and Tom Herman, you know, he, he, he ran his – offense uh at Ohio, well, he ran the offense at Ohio State uh and then when he was the head coach uh at Houston and Texas as well um and so you see a lot of these different things especially with the running back attack uh trying to you know get the get four or five yards no huddle uh a lot of that I feel comes from Tom Herman um but then you see a lot of the the pro style like shotgun sets where they're dropping back and passing that that probably comes a little bit more from the charlie fry uh scheme a little bit and then you see it kind of all come together with the play action where it, the run game that herman instituted is building off of the, the play action style that that charlie fry uh is instituting so I think they work together uh, in a lot of different situations, but at the end of the day, I think Coach Herman will leave it off of uh, or will back off of Fry and, you know, it's his offense. Uh, it, at the end of the day, it, it he'll leave it up to Charlie, I imagine, to kind of uh, make the decision in terms of play calling. I, I don't think there's many scenarios where uh, Herman's overruling uh, Charlie on play calls. And, and in terms of defense, no one messes with Coach Rock. Nobody. Well, you know, last season FAU gets four wins. This season, you make. I'm not down there in Florida, but you make it exciting. This FAU team has got a lot to look forward to this year. What does success look like for the Owls in 2024? Well, I was on a West Coast radio about a week ago, and I got asked, uh, what is FAU's ceiling? I hate the ceiling question. I'm glad you asked me what uh, success looks like. Because ceiling, uh, the ceiling is 12-0 and and making a run at the college football playoffs, especially right now. Uh, you can't – there's – I mean, you know, there is no reason why you can't say, okay, yeah, FAU is not at least going to try uh, to run the table here and, and make it to be the G5 spot. Uh, but, you know, things do happen. Uh, so success for this team is a bowl game. Uh, making a bowl game first one since 2019 would definitely uh, definitely help the fan base out winning that bowl game. Um, but looking at the schedule a little bit, um, there is there's, there's some favorability to it. Um, some people like to say, I believe on West Coast Radio, I was told it was one of the easiest schedules in the country. I don't know about that because uh, the AAC is, is very talented in uh, in football this season. So I feel like a lot of those games against AAC opponents are uh, overlooked a little bit. Um, but taking a look at the schedule. So through the first five games, they go – the heart, in my opinion, the toughest game is on the road at Michigan State, first game of the year. Chalk that up. Let's say let's say, let's say, say things go as the line makers will put it, FAU loses that one. Then they go Army at home, FAU, FIU at home, UConn on the road, and then Wagner at home. Unless, you know, unless UConn goes crazy uh, – and that's a stretch where FAU should finish four and one. Uh, and that sets them up that all of a sudden that's a four and one start to the season. Then you got a little bit of a tough stretch and you play North Texas at home, UTSA on the road, South Florida at home, uh, and then East Carolina on the road as well. So that's that stretch is where the season will be decided. If they go into that at four and one and then they split it two and two. All of a sudden that's six. You're all you're bowl eligible right there. Um, so the, uh, then the final three games of the season, Temple, Charlotte, Tulsa. So if you're at six games, uh, with three, you're, if you're already at six wins, uh, with three games left to go and 
one of and one of them is at home. So that's against Charlotte, who has a very tough schedule this season. Uh, and, and who knows where they will be at by the end of the season. I don't take it. I I won't be surprised if Biff Pogey somehow pulls it all together and Charlotte's a uh, contender because I'm a huge fan of Biff Pogey. But there's just a lot of potential in that schedule. So I think the Owls have at least a a, a, a very solid possibility of eight wins this season with seven and five being I don't see how they don't get there so I looked up at teamsranking.com I don't know uh, how professional that they are but uh, they do have FAU as strength of schedule number 100 so oh wow not the easiest not the easiest yeah. yeah, so it's 34 or so teams easier. Who yep. uh, is Liberty? Is Liberty number 134? No, they have Kennesaw State as number 34. 134. Co- same conference as Liberty, so yeah. So. Um, we've talked a lot today offense, defense, uh, depth, um, recruiting, and even some college basketball. But uh, is there anything else you want to share or think that we should know about this 2024 Florida Atlantic Owls football team? Um, I think that I, the student fan base, um, is definitely, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting crowd, uh, at FAU. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the student tailgate is crazy. Uh, if you guys haven't, uh, heard about that or seen about that, uh, if you ever get a chance to come down to Boca Raton, the student culture for football tailgates is awesome. Uh, and I think if FAU is able to have, you know, extended success this season uh, and, and help the fan, the, especially the FAU is bringing in their largest incoming freshman class ever. Uh, second straight year, they've actually set that record. Um, but if, but if FA, with this incoming freshman class, uh, the, the, the crazy student tailgate culture is always there. So that's not an issue, but if FAU is able to put together a winning season with the biggest freshman class ever coming i think that will do a lot in in kind of helping build more you know f- fans awareness uh as you know me and justice were talking about this before before we started the south florida um sports fan uh region is it's a tough market it's a tough market and if you're not uh consistently winning games uh it can be tough to try to to try to fill out the whole stadium so i think the student fan base is awesome i think that um you know it should gets it should get a little bit more attention uh but i think if fau is uh able to have um, a very successful season i think it'll get i think the students will kind of buy into football a little bit more to where they've been buying into basketball a lot over the past two years that stadium hasn't had a uh empty seat in it and i believe almost two years now so uh they want to get that over to football the the rowdiness is there the student tailgates are packed out um it just got to work on trying to you know convince them to come onto the games and I, they won't it won't really be an issue if they start uh winning and i think with you know the start to the season the potential to start the season four and one which i think is you know, uh, Army at home is very difficult. I don't think that will be as uh, – it won't be a, a chalk up. Uh, chalk, I can't chalk that one up as a for sure victory. But if they're able to pull it off, I think 4-1 and one is very attainable. And I think at that point, you're not only the football team is running with momentum, but the fans too. I think, you know, they see, okay, FAU's 4-1. and one. We're two games away from bowl eligibility for the first time in two years. Wow, like we got to go to the game. Like – I think this season is a really big season for FAU, not not just not just on the field, but off the field. I think it's a it's a it's a culture building season everywhere. So a lot to watch for FAU on the field. But if if they are successful, which I believe they can be, I think it'll be um, a season where the fan base uh, really shows itself as well. Well, Robbie, thank you again for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. And uh, I might have to get up to uh, an Iowa game this season. I've never been, but it's, it seems awesome. It, You know, come on up. You got a place to stay. Not too far. Let's All do right. it. Let's do it, man. Thank you guys again. Absolutely. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you're listening to podcast form, please rate and review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thank you all for your support. And until the next time, we are the G5 High. We'll fight, fight, fight for FAU, we're born in paradise. We'll fight, fight, fight for FAU, you know we're going to win and it's going to be nice. Cheering our football team out.
time to feel.